Okay, thank you everyone. It's very kind of Chris and the UXPA Society to invite me tonight. It's a great pleasure to be talking with you. What I'm going to be talking about is what's up in the title, which is something that I'm very keen on and I think is very important. And I think there's a lot of errors being made in the design community and, and it's worth looking at a little bit more detail. The word meaning. We all talk about meaning. We just about any design or any creative activity of any sort that people do, there's always discussions about the meaning. This is about the meaning, the customer has this meaning, the user has this meaning, the doctor has this meaning, and so forth. But the difficulties start when we start to ask the question of what exactly the designer meant with the word meaning, because it's, it's a very used word. If you look it up and do some checks on the internet, it's splashed all over everything these days, but there's a lot of doubts about what we mean. I'd like to just pull out a couple of key issues from the dictionary statements. Any dictionary, any thesaurus you look at, we're talking about the significance or purpose, so we're talking about the what, and these days, very important in design to focus also on the motivation or the intention that the user or the customer or the client or, or the local community or whoever it is we're talking about, what in the world is the reason that they're engaging with this particular interface or this particular meeting or this particular activity, whatever it might be. Now, a couple years ago, because of this little bit of frustration I had with our design work and with some of the work in the international design community at the different universities and the different teams, I spent quite a bit of time, reviewed my canonical six to eight hundred journal papers and books and trawled the internet. Anything I could find from philosophy, starting from the ancient Greeks to today, linguistics, semiotics, design, engineering, computer science, psychology, sociology, you name it, we dug it all out. At the end of the day, what was quite fascinating was all the different disciplines and all the different specialities have their own words for things and their own outlook and their frame that they look at the problem at. But really, if you take a look and sort of group things, you can basically get it down to three basic things everyone's talking about, regardless of the fact that the words might change a bit. The most obvious one that in UX and computer science and design we're always worried about, of course, is function. The natural purpose of something, the way something is done. And at the end of the day, it is the case that as designers, we know very well that when we're focusing on what we're trying to achieve, some things just need to be done. Sending the email by pushing send just needs to be done. There are some intricacies with the language and the layout, but the fact is certain things are just practical and the simplest way to do it is the best. And semiotic content or deep meanings is not really a much of an issue. And we're all familiar in design with these sorts of situations. Now, I apologize. A lot of the examples tonight are going to be artifacts, products, because I work more in product design than anything else, but also because they're easier to visualize, a little bit easier to get the points across with, with thingies, with, with objects. If we take a look, we're all familiar with various tools and practicalities, chairs. It's easy to forget the fact now in 2018 that the Thone chair was about industrial production and using only three, four pieces of wood and making something very simple. Today, it's a semiotic statement and an article of elegance, and we'll come back to this later in the talk. But at the time, it was simply the cheapest, simplest thing you could do to make a chair for an average person to let them afford it. And we're all familiar with this sort of functional approach to innovation and to design. And a great example of that we always talk about is the Swiss Army knife. You know, add another blade, incremental innovation rather than disup disruptive innovation. Let's just add another thingy. And sometimes it can be a little bit more complex, the relationship, because something like a Fiat from the 1960s is a case of industrial functionality of manufacturing. So there, yes, the interface is very simple, but there's also a lot of functionality in the fact making it that way makes it cheaper and easier to mass produce and meet the need of people. And we all know things like calculators and other tools. We just mostly use them because they do stuff for us. But that's not the complete picture. 
going back several thousand years to the ancient Greeks to today, whether it's linguistics or sociology or psychology or design or UX, we all know there's such a thing as rituals. As human beings, we are creatures that have certain rhythms and patterns to our everyday life. Sometimes those patterns are deeply ingrained, and sometimes the pattern has meaning for us and is valuable to us, regardless of whether there's any functional content or not. Taking your son for an ice cream on Saturday morning at the local park that's not too far away from home to walk to. Having your coffee and reading your paper in the morning over breakfast and so forth and so on. And of course, chatting somebody up at the water cooler is another classic. These are all rituals that quite often in design, we might get the function right, and we might talk about the user using our interface to do something, but sometimes we might miss some of the semiotic messages that are involved. And the fact of the matter is, no matter what discipline involving humans you review, you will find studies, books, materials, thoughts, essays, books, where they talk about the aesthetic and semiotic content of some pattern of behavior, some moving of the body to do something. It's not just looking at something. It's you moving about, lifting something, eating something, doing something. There are semiotic or values associated with these dances that we do, and these are very important to us. And as a designer, if we go violate them, we do this at our own risk. And there's lots of examples of that. Um, cosmetics and jewelry and fashion are excellent examples. Much of the fashion industry is about semiotic messages rather than something being functional or simply cheap or easy to use. But it goes deeper than that. Why do we have to get our hair cut in a place that looks like some sort of a cathedral? Why do we have to be under incandescent lights and have mirrors and have hundreds of mirrors and have videos playing, whatever? Because it's a ritual. It's an experience. We talk about the experience economy in the, in, since the noughties. We've been talking more and more about our economy being experienced. Like, well, we've been doing these sorts of things for years. Personalization. Putting your name on your child's jacket is a lot more than just a functional thing about making sure you can find the jacket again at the end of the day when they leave school. There's a lot more to it. Personalization is an industry all to itself on many artifacts, and certainly in software and settings and other environments, personalization is a huge issue. And I put up there a little picture of a design project from a few years ago, a little concept that they did. I don't know if it was manufactured yet or not. The morning toast. We live in the UK. We love our toast and jam and our tea in the morning. Well, somebody came up with a laser printer toaster, and the idea was they removed the bottom of the machine so you could see your toast coming through very slowly and going in white on one side and coming out a nice golden brownish color on the other side, and you could enjoy it. And the rollers were slowed down to make sure this doesn't just happen instantaneously and pop out the other side, but it takes a minute or so to do it, and you can just see your toast coming out because the pleasure and the enjoyment in this was to see the thing happen and to enjoy it. If you just grab it, stuff it in your mouth, and make it disappear in 10 seconds, where's the fun in that? These sorts of issues are becoming more and more issues of design. And there's many cafes here in London that have an Electra, an Electra made in Milano. You don't need something that looks out of a steampunk uh, movie to make a cappuccino. But the fact of the matter is Electra came out with these patents in 1890s, and they've been making bigger and more silver-plated and more shiny, and the handle gets longer, and everything gets bigger as time passes, because the ritual of pulling that coffee is much more important to some people than the actual drinking of the coffee. And whereas this was like a little added value 20, 30 years ago, this is the game for much design, and including a lot of things in software and IT and other digital industries as well. And then finally, the third fundamental category of meaning, which arises from all the different professions, is this one here. Call it myth, if you prefer. You can call it semiotic or symbolic purity or pure value. Whatever name you want to take for it, the fact of the matter is some things have meaning for people even in the absence of function and in the complete absence of action. So whereas a ritual involves you doing something, move your hand, click the button, listen to something, put something on, whatever, go out for the evening, myth 
is that category which would describe the value you gain from sitting at the museum, sitting at the Victoria de Albert or sitting in the British Museum, just sitting there on your bench looking at something and thinking about enjoying it. No action involved with the camera. We can film it, don't see the person move at all. And yet they're smiling. Something is happening. It's because there's a certain semiotic and there's a certain meaning being transmitted from the reflection, the cognitive thinking, the appreciation, and, and the rationalizing of what's going on. Lots of products show that as well. For example, for those in the room who like their Formula One and their sports cars, up at the top we have a typical steering wheel from a recent production Ferrari. I work a lot with the people from Ferrari. The Ferrari is basically a semiotic machine. It's got nothing to do with cars or going fast. Could go twice as fast as it actually does. It's designed to feel like it's going fast, but it's not. To make it feel like it's going fast, you actually have to design it, the gearbox and the engine, the way that it actually goes much slower. But that's the way we've been doing it in Ferrari for the last 20 years. If we look at that up there, on the right-hand side of the steering wheel, there's a little lever switch. There's a little one, two, three, four, five position setting called in Italian the manettino, the little handle. That switch is up there. It's a bit of a throwback to the 1970s, a little manual selector. That's selecting whether the car will take your control actions directly or translate it by algorithms into a performance of its own. So if you leave it on the bottom setting, it's very close to just doing what you're asking it to do when you push the pedal or turn the wheel. When you put it at the top, it's basically doing what it wants. So you're basically saying, I'd like to go to the left, or I'd like to go to the right, and then it figures out the right way to do it. And if it's on snow and it has to counter, so it just does everything on its own, and you feel like you did something really clever, but the car did everything by itself. That little handle is up there, and it has that shape, that size, and that color, because that's the handle that's on the steering wheel for many years now on the F1 car. So the person who buys a Ferrari or a Lamborghini is probably motivated by their passion for racing, and they probably watch the F1 races. And putting that handle up there, even though it's a little bit more clumsy, it's a little bit less aesthetic, and it's a little bit less practical and functional than what the designer probably wanted, putting that up there just enriches the experience of owning that car many-fold. And then up there, there's lots of other things. Buying your Batman or your latest Hollywood movie, paraphernalia, that again is a semiotic content. You're not buying it because it's practical or, or necessarily feeds a ritual. Up at the top-hand corner, we have things like Ray-Ban glasses, the first glasses that the first aviators used in the 1920s when finally airplanes could fly high enough to go above the clouds and now they got the sun in their face and it's dangerous to fly like that. So they need glasses with polarized lens to take some of the sun away. Today, you pay 150 pounds for a Ray-Ban, not because it's any better than the other one that costs 10 quid, but because you want to associate with that semiotic and that set of values. You want to send a message of personal identity that you share something in common with the spirit of those individuals. Motorbikes, watches that cost thousands of pounds and so forth, cowboy boots. Cowboy was a phenomenon that in the United States lasted less than 30 years. It was only during the gap between when they had no communications to the West at all and when finally the railroad arrived, about 20 years. An insignificant period of American history, but a great story for Hollywood. So everybody wants to associate with something, a figure that only was around a couple of years and then disappeared. So these are all typical examples of the myths. So meaning is the what and the why, and is definitely three categories. And we could split hairs and fine tune them more and subdivide into further details if we wanted. But those three categories already capture much of what's happening. A few things that need to be mentioned because there's a lot of issues in design that we get confused sometimes when we're having these discussions in meetings and on projects. First of all, context. As UX designers, as designers, as product designers, service designers, there's a variety of people in the room will all be familiar that we cannot neglect the context. The context changes everything. It affects everything. It affects our emotional reactions to the product and so forth and so on. Well, it also can change the meaning. This little example from a little research study from the 1980s illustrates quite nicely. They asked the people, 
what will, can you tell us about that little triangle that's on the left? When they showed only the top line on a card of paper, the people said, well, that's the triangle. When they showed what's on the second line all by itself, separately, they said, well, that's the smallest one of the three. When they showed the third, they said, well, actually, it's the big one that's on the sheet of paper, the white one, the equilateral one. So the kinds of words we use to describe things, and it's not just the language, it's also the deeper meaning, what we're interpreting that to be, the way we're saving it in our long-term memory, is very dependent on what's behind it. Take a French car, put it in Paris, it looks lovely. But in central London, not always the same effect. Say, take a typical thing, a green car. Where do you find more green cars? In the mountains, in the Alps. Where do you find the blue car statistically more? Near the beach, in places where there's water nearby. So these sorts of things of the, contra the background context and the thing that you're producing, and on the computers, lots and lots of these opportunities, very important because it does affect not just the background contrast, but also the meaning that remains in the person's mind. And there's plenty of studies, and I won't go into all the detail, but there's lots of academic detail about the fact that, yes, sometimes some meanings will change with gender. Men and women will interpret the same object in the same context, sometimes in a different manner, depending on the object. There are certainly differences with age. Young people love their toys and their tools, their learning. Older people love their reflections and their interpretations more, the philosophy of it. Big differences sometimes in the meaning associated with the same objects on the screen that we put in front of them. And certainly culture, we know that there are some differences, even though sometimes they're exaggerated, but there are some differences from culture to culture. And then finally, one last issue just in the roundup of issues related to meaning, it's very important. Lots and lots of businesses get very muddled about this slide and the next slide. There are two issues that do tend to confound a bit our design discussions and, and sort of create a bit of hiccup for the creative team about what we're trying to achieve. The question of the change. Very few things in this world come into existence as a new technology or a new fashion or a new ritual that people do or a new type of trend. Very few things come into this world, remain in this world exactly the same, and then leave this world and disappear completely. Most of the time, things come in and they begin to evolve. And there's two directions of evolution, and quite often businesses are not clear where the design brief they're asking you to do where they're positioning themselves on this, call it curve, or this tendency. One of them is this one, from myth to ritual to function, from the purely semiotic to the purely everyday practical. Great example of that that you will find in a very small number of publications, a very small number of books will make a tangential reference to it, the motor vehicle. When the first cars came out, these were toys for rich people. It's like the queen has a horse, but I got a horseless carriage. I'll show her, and I'll drive into London on my one horsepower panhard. At the beginning, these were things you did to show distinction, personal identity, to express yourself, to do something different, to have a pure experience, to just have fun. Whatever the motivation was, it certainly wasn't about going to work. Over the years, though, prices drop. Functionality gets perfected by the designers, the situation evolves, it starts to become something of the middle class, and then eventually it reaches most people in our society to the point that some people will today view something like a motor vehicle or a bus or a transport as simply a pure A to B functionality with no further semiotic context. If you're buying the Bentley, you see something semiotic, you're expressing yourself, you want to park in your driveway and show off to your neighbors. But if you're buying the Fiat Cinquecento or the Panda, probably it's because you simply want to get to work and find a parking space. That's one direction of evolution. And one of the questions sometimes we have to ask our industrial partners and our business partners, people around London companies and so forth, is where do you want to be on that? Where do you think you are? because the thing's been around for 10 years now as a technology, but where are you placing it for your business? Do you want to hit the first time buyers? Do you want to get the people who are already seeing it as a more functional? Because there is a drift across the three meanings over time as society comes to grips and gets familiar with it. 
And the other direction occurs, and this one's very rare to see anything. Very few books of design, very few designers, very few design consultancies around town actually talk about this clearly. And that's the other direction. Things can start very functional and take on eventually a ritual and then eventually take on purely myth or symbolic or semiotic meaning. Great example of that is eyeglasses. In Roman times and in Greek times, they had lenses. People keep them in their pocket. Don't think the Greeks and Romans didn't have many of the same clothes and lenses and tools and things we have today. They had many of them. At that time, you would keep it in your pocket, and if you needed it, you'd pull it out for a minute, but you wouldn't let anybody see it because it was a sign of the fact you were sick, you were ill, you couldn't see. It was stigmatizing at the time. And that went on all through the medieval until the early Renaissance. And then people started to get a little bit less uptight about it, and mass production started to increase. And eventually, by the time of the Industrial Revolution, these things were being pushed out with black or gray frames in large numbers. Lots of people are walking down the strand with these things on their faces. It's no longer a problem. Everybody's got one. It gets to be accepted, so it becomes a ritual to wear it. Eventually, it gets to the point that it becomes an article of personal expression. And many softwares and apps today are exactly in that same position. They started to do something very simple, like booking a hotel, and now they're meaning something very different from the original uh, concept. And you get to the point that you see today, as you do in central London, lots of people wearing glasses or rims with no lenses on it, just the rim, because it's a fashion statement as in this picture here. So there's a lens, a frame, and there's a color, and it's all an ensemble and a fashion accessory, but there's actually no lens in there. It's not being used for any functional purpose. It's purely myth or, or semiotic structure. So that's a little roundup of some key issues about meaning, the what and the why, the three basic categories. Yes, we can fine tune more, but those three are really the gross categories that, that come out of any analysis of any source of literature. And some practical observations about things like the effect of the background and the direction of travel that your product or your interface or your experience could go in after you've launched it. Little example, if some of that seems like, well, why is this gentleman talking about this stuff? It doesn't affect me and my everyday work and so forth and so on. Just a little example of the kind of way this kind of thing creeps into our everyday work, all of us, and where the issues sometimes come up. A little study we did about a year ago, 2023 study, 20 artifacts, 20 people, three questions we asked them. Let's go take a look if the designers and the customers say the same things. Very simple little test. So we rounded up 20 artifacts from the world of fashion. We round up uh, some from the world of fashion, some from uh, consumer products. A lot of them are artifacts, and some of them are touching upon commodities. And some of the price ranges go from very close to a commodity price to a luxury on the other extreme of the spectrum. So a bit of a random mix of things that cover our everyday experience and a mix of price ranges and a mix of the spectrum from a pure commodity to a luxury. So 20 artifacts, 20 people, 20, 10 being just everyday users, and the other 10 being people who are self-professed designers, people who either study design or work in a consultancy today or work in a company in a design creative role. So the everyday blokes and the design experts. The questions. This artifact that's on this sheet of paper or sitting on the table in front of you, which of the three meanings that we were mentioning in the introduction do you think is most associated or most representative of that thing you're looking at? What adjectives, what words would you cough up from a word association or free elicitation? What would you say about it? And then finally, which features would you talk about, would you want us to note about that object? Quick look after showing one at a time over the course of the day these different artifacts and collecting these statements from the people. A quick look, the users and the designers. If we look how many times they quoted one of the artifacts being highly functional, and if the numbers don't add up to exactly 
20 by 20. It's because sometimes people said, well, I can't decide. It, it's, it's very functional, but I can see it being ritual. So we let them say whatever they felt. We didn't try to constrain it. So we're just counting up how many times that indication pops up. Designers, functional, 117 mentions over the course of the day across the, 20, across the 10 people. Ritual 76, myth 81. The random sample of consumers, a lot more mention of ritual and myth. So what's happening there? As professionals, we have our frame of reference. We're trained, we're skilled, we're very proud of, of our work, we work very hard. We've been trained to focus a lot on functional issues. Reaction times, hovering times, dwell times, reduce the number of options, keep it seven plus or minus two on the interface. Let's use this background color. Let's have this layout. Let's have this format. There's a whole lot of practical, functional knowledge that's ingrained in us and we're doing it. But when we're talking to the, the punters, the punters are highlighting a whole set of other things they're looking for, which are not the functionality. And quite often, the functionality can be in direct contradiction. And to illustrate that a little bit more, if we take a couple of examples, and I'll have three examples spanning a bit the space of complexity of how complex the artifact was, starting with a picture frame. If we take a look at a picture frame, the designer group of 10 people, most of the indications that we got back were about function and the kinds of words which popped up with the greatest frequency amongst the group of designers were words like durable and easy and practical, exactly what you'd expect from a functional, practical, efficient uh, thinking through of the process. We look at the 10 random selected users or consumers, classic attractive cultural, there's some words popping up under the category of myth, daily gift, gift's a great one, Designers very rarely consider the semiotic content that the thing might have when it's passed to someone else as a gift, rather than it's always the assumption you're the user. And a lot of the artifacts, you are never the user. It's always a gift. Gift, nostalgic, popular. Function, of course, shows up again to some degree, useful, easy, and so forth. So something very, very simple and very, very basic, there's already a bit of discrepancy between the professionals and you know, a randomly selected group of consumers. And then as we go up in complexity and, and complexity of design, complexity of functionality, complexity of considerations, materials, colors, shapes, forms, and so forth, we start to see even more divergence. For example, the Philips radio, empowering, energetic, friendly fun relaxing, classic, whatever. We see a lot more words in the ritual and in the myth categories with the random sample of users and consumers than we do for the designers. And the words are diverging quite a bit. The word happy shows up with the users. Happy was very commonly repeated by the users. Word never came out from the group of designers that I recall. And then finally, something that of course is, is by nature very semiotic, because it's carrying a message. We choose it, we choose the color, we choose the nature of the product for very specific social purposes. Here the divergence is, is quite strong. And there's a lot of words in the user category which are just not showing up amongst the designers. So this little study isn't trying to, to reveal anything particularly deep. We all know that as professionals we have opinions and not always are the opinions fully capture uh, the intended target audience. But the interesting part is that a lot of what we do is very functional and those second and third categories, the ritual everyday behaviors of people have not always ethnographically been cataloged to sufficient depth to capture it in the design. And certainly the purely semiotic aesthetic and mythological, that category is quite often missed. A lot of architecture and a lot of different designs that designers do are purely semiotic content. And a few artistic designers are allowed to do that, but many design teams don't really have that in their remit. And it's creating great problems on the commercial side. So I'll stop that because I'm being told, stop, please. <laughs> and he's getting threatening, so that's <laughs> Yes, sir.
expectation that would be the role they should be capturing it uh, very carefully in practice my personal experience which of course is is not um, any sort of scientific proof it's not exactly the case and there is one reason for that which is a lot of marketing a lot of branding and to be fair a lot of design work the ethnography involved is quite often surveys interviews some observational work, possibly some mind maps or some word elicitation, or some extreme users, bit of personas, bit of scenarios. They're all good stuff and they all need to be done. But there is one issue, which is the background contrast against which the meaning emerges, the gatekeeper is emotion. If your heart's thumping because you almost had a crash, your opinion of the infotainment system in the car could be very different. Capturing things within minutes when short-term memory and the subconscious of the human mind is most active, rather than letting the frontal cortex and the rational find a nice narrative to explain its choice, capturing it in the heat of the moment and getting the emotional gut feeling from the people is something which is difficult, expensive, time-consuming, and not every, one, not every organization is fully trained up and ready to do that, and a lot of marketing and branding is not doing it either. So at the moment, a lot of that's being missed. That background context isn't just asking a question to the bloke when they're in the city. It's about asking specific questions about things happening while they're driving. They managed to send service a lot of Coca-Cola despite the fact that it's just really too reward. <laughs> They're connecting with some stuff. Well, the, the, there's also the issue, there's also the issue, I'm alluding to meanings here which are already existent. Now, if Coca-Cola or Burberry or someone else is creating a new meaning by getting a famous person to do something and show something, create a new value or a new ritual, that's a slightly different thing. It's one thing to say, as we're saying here, there's these types and there's lots of them out there. And if you're working on something, you know, such as an interface of some sort, it may be touching upon ones we're already familiar with. Check them and, and talk to your people when they're using it. Find out what they really, really think it's supposed to do and what it's doing. That's one approach. Another approach is to say, I will get Beyonce to wear this outfit and I will create the demand from there, which is closer to art. It's closer to expression. What we've talked about here is working with the existing ones. There are ways to create as well. A lot of times the marketing and branding team is not bad on that approach, which is creating the new demand, but quite often gets a few things wrong on the existing meanings, quite often. Just a bit of something more yeah. I'm assuming that most of us work in software, and uh, most of your examples were... Yeah, probably. I'm wondering if, uh, if I'm wondering if there's any examples you do of in the software world which tends to be a lot quicker, and I am a lot quicker as a result, um, where there's been a lot of very strong mythical meaning versus functioning. You're talking about moving in one direction rather than the other direction. Well, even software is designed to be, have a very strong mythical meaning rather than a very strong practical meaning. Um, to, to come up with a good example of that, uh, hmm. uh, one really blatant one doesn't pop into my head at the moment at this time, and I'd apologize for that. But there's, there's a lot of tools which start out, for example, right now there's a lot of things in uh, virtual reality, there's a lot of things in augmented reality, there's a lot of avatars. Uh, I wouldn't say chatbots because they're already quite well developed, but there's a lot of AI tools. A lot of these things on the first deployment are very similar to the motor vehicle 
of the example up there, which we're all familiar with, which is we're starting out with something which the early adopter and the, the technological fan will take on. And that's very close to a personal identity statement. It's a way of life statement. And it's very much a curiosity and a fun, you know, sort of a entertainment thing. But each of these tools have, that have been rolled out over the last 10, 15 years, and we can think of products from Alphabet or Microsoft, whoever, that have rolled things out and started out life as sort of a, a curiosity. Quite often, they find a practical use. For example, virtual reality was stalled for a long time, but now it's starting to make a comeback in a few specific areas, such as medical training, such as um, real estate. In China, there's a lot of real estate agencies rather than calling you out to the building site to see some dusty cement and a few empty windows that haven't been installed, you will walk through a 3D rendering. Arup here in London has some amazing 3D rendering softwares with full 3D vision and the sound cityscape where you can walk down the street and actually experience what the traffic change will cause for the noise and the directivity of noise. So there's a lot of things in you know, augmented reality, virtual reality, whatever, given you asked about more software and digital, there's a lot of things which are starting out as you know, a bit of fun. And then very rapidly, oh, the architect can use it for that. Oh, the city planner, if he could walk down the street and actually notice the difference from the cycling path, the noise it makes, that would be easy for the city council to then decide to vote on that. And you know, Arup and Foster and the others are doing these things. Sorry I didn't get a more consumer one, but uh, you caught me a bit. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, we'll do the next one right now. So if anyone has any more questions, I'm sure Joseph will be more than happy to answer them. Uh, can we thank Joseph for his talk?